don't break things enough. You know, one Christmas, we went to my uncle's house who had a bunch of really fragile things, you know? He collected antiques uh, and had fancy ornaments on his tree and basically did not childproof his house at all. So I rolled up on Christmas and uh, I destroyed everything in my path. I pulled on a stocking, you know, as, as kids do, uh, and down comes a bunch of antiques that shatter onto the floor, right? Uh, I, I sit somewhere else and BAM! Knock over some other, like, priceless ornament that shatters into a million pieces. And uh, as a toddler, I was sick all the time, right? So, um, they placed me down by the tree, hoping that I was as far away from as many valuables as possible. And I sneezed, and my hand went back and shattered yet another ornament. Uh, that's how the story goes. I've always heard it secondhand, uh, since I was far too young to remember. It's a story that's kind of a mythology about myself. I have no idea whether or not that's how it actually happened, but I've heard it a hundred times because it must have some kind of potent relevance that says something to this day about me. Or it's just funny. When you're a kid, there's a hundred stories about you. Some you remember and some you don't. Um, and we have an idealized past about ourselves. And then you know, you grow up and you stop breaking things. Let's go back in time. This is a vision of the past, a time I never lived in. Contemporary art was in its golden age and I was missing it. This is before we had a culture dominated by the right-wing narrative that art is snooty, bourgeoisie, and literally only bananas taped to walls. There's crowded coffee shops with poets exchanging work back and forth, a jazz band producing something nobody has heard before, trying something new. I think about places I've only dreamed of, where musicians, painters, illustrators, writers, whatever else, are just coming together and making shit. Sure, bananas tape the walls there too, but that's just set dressing. Whether it's the funny kind or not, they're joking around. A painter is looking out at a river and thinking about how that can influence his brushstrokes and isn't afraid that telling people that will make them laugh in his face and call him pretentious. I think about when images had meaning, where we don't have the illustration wing of MSNBC as media artist Brad Trammell puts it. You know, paintings of Ruth Bader Ginsburg that make you feel nothing but emptiness. I'm tired of looking at art in galleries and museums and asking, who is this for? What is this saying? How am I supposed to feel about this? I want less of that and more of something that is something. It lives and breathes. I want a world where massive corporations didn't dominate creative industries which work to entirely eliminate or push out independent creators, or anyone really with a voice that isn't able to bend to the will of a few art dealers, and where software companies like Adobe didn't hold near monopolies on the creative tools people need. One where climate disaster did not sit as the fire at the end of the tunnel. One where I can make anything I want to make without having to feed an algorithm that wants hollow eye candy and five second content. One simply without cryptocurrency. <sighs> Look, I know I'm bullshitting you. You and I both know that past never existed. There were times before Adobe's dominance, or a time before we knew about climate change, or hell, a time where our government funded art directly in a meaningful sense. But never this idealized past. Never all of these things. We're facing every shit thing all at once, and so you gotta ask yourself, what are we doing here, man? <laughs> You heard it before, art making is pointless right now if you really think about it. Nothing I ever make or say will affect an actual change. My words won't drive shell oil out of business. A VR experience I make won't get us a different president. And a video I make isn't going to undo racism or homophobia or misogyny or transphobia or any other form of oppression that there is. Nor do my videos ever attempt that. This video isn't attempting that either. And I'm not trying to be pessimistic here, but 
Let's face it, there's more you can do to make the world a better place by being an electrician than you can as an artist. The amount of people who think a thought or feel a feeling from my artwork pales in comparison to the amount of people who would really like it if the lighting in their house turned on. And let's talk about who we're selling this to. Unless you are a starving artist, studio art is prohibitively expensive and not a part of average people's lives. And if you want to display your work to the people, the only way to do that, as far as I can tell, is to have some gallery sponsor an exhibition that goes on to a museum that puts it on to an increasingly smaller audience each year. Why make anything? If nobody's going to see it unless someone decides to select you, there's no way to make a living off of it unless you price exorbitantly. And there's a culture around you that really couldn't care less whether or not art is a frosting on top of their lives or not. I've been reading some letters recently that artist and filmmaker Jean Cocteau exchanged with philosopher and theologian Jacques Maritain in 1926. Easy, light reading, you know, coffee table stuff. These letters come at a three-year period in Cocteau's life where he converted back to the religion of his childhood, Catholicism. Cocteau here is really angry. He doesn't like that there's a bunch of artists running around saying that you need to be making art for art's sake. Now, much has been discussed over the question of why one makes art. Cocteau might argue some higher spiritual purpose. Others may ask, why does one breathe? It's a part of living. While certainly not the only debate to exist in the arts, believe me, there's plenty, Cocteau is responding to an important split that was occurring to a particularly heated level between secular art and spiritual art. Cocteau gets that it's 1926 and we just got out of a horrible war, which is going to change the aesthetics of art as people grapple with this. This is really where our story begins. World War I's particular brutality completely disconnected people from the world they lived in. While some people turned to spirituality after the war, others turned away from it in favor of indulging more human desires. And this was happening in the arts too, with these art for art's sake guys and Cocteau's sudden conversion. To be clear, Cocteau doesn't believe in the moralistic arts of European art history. He's not trying to paint churches with depictions of hell so horrifying the average European gets on their knees and prays to Jesus. He does think, however, that art should serve some higher power rather than just exist solely because it can or must. Those old paintings in churches existed for a horrified peasant, and notably one who can't read and needs to get biblical messages from images, but now we gotta make art for the educated Parisian coffee sipper. And you know, he's right. We're really not considering the perspective of early 20th century snooty French guys. Art's function in society around the time Cocteau is writing here is beginning to change. He wants that change to be called art for God. Essentially, the belief in a higher power allows God's work to hide itself into your work. Your art with the emotions it conveys allows for God to speak through you if you let him. Here's the catch. Rather than depict biblical scenes, now the focus should be on helping people through spiritual crises in our modern world. One must translate him into all the living languages and help him to hide himself to do good, just as the devil hides himself to do evil. You might not think a work has a divine message or is spiritual in nature, but it secretly does and is. Now that most people who are concerned with art can read, Art's spiritual nature can depart from realistic images of the divine planes and start focusing on more abstract concepts of spirituality. We can make things that address our real world that clearly, after the war, is in such need of direction. Maritain interprets Cocteau in his response. 
In art which does not paint the things of Christ, but which snatches real pieces from heaven and renders the inimitable sound of the impact of intelligence upon beauty, is the art that from a greater or lesser distance prepares for God's actions in the world the most worthy instrument. He's essentially saying here, hell yeah, John, you're definitely on to something. We should be applying religious messaging and channeling God into work more relevant to our current time. Since World War I, growth of members in major religions has slowed with population growth. Throughout that century, and so far in this one, the world has become a more and more secularized place, where religions still dominate, but are less and less influential with each generation. In North America and Europe, cultural shifts, outdated thinking, and religious trauma have turned churches into more and more disconnected islands, far from people's reality, rather than the center of it. This, I think, is the problem artists like Cocteau believe they can solve. Art for God says that people need to be offered new perspectives and worlds that change the way they see. That way, when God sends them a divine message, they are primed to notice it and listen. I bring up Cocteau because I need ammunition for parties. That's the only reason. I mean, what do you want me to do? Stand in the background and just like sit there awkwardly when everyone goes out to smoke? Oh, they don't know I've read writings from a French filmmaker. Last time I just sat there half drunkenly insisting that weed pipes look phallic. I'm not kidding. Nor do I think I'm wrong about that either. I mean, seriously, just look at, uh, Right, Cocteau. Um, Cocteau's idea of art for God helps to understand a long tradition of artists who place their work in divine contexts, either thinking that their art practice makes them just like the gospel writers and monks who kept the holy texts alive, or that they are some kind of shaman. Artists who believe that they are the only thing that stands between the spiritual world and the physical one, running back and forth, delivering letters. God's postal service, as I like to call it. When Cocteau and Maritain called for a new language that could hide God into artwork that would give the viewer an emotional, spiritual experience of God himself, that language would become abstract art. One of the most important abstract artists working today, Gerard Richter, has said, Abstract pictures make visible a reality that we can neither see nor describe, but whose existence we can postulate. We denote this reality in negative terms. The unknown, the incomprehensible, the infinite. And for thousands of years, we have been depicting it through surrogate images such as heaven and hell, gods and devils. In abstract painting, we have found a better way of gaining access to the unvisualizable, the incomprehensible. Art is the highest form of hope. Wassily Kandinsky, a foundational abstract artist, would write a whole book about this in 1912 called Concerning the Spiritual in Art which called for art that married, quote, two, two universes, universes in one, one the, the visible universe of matter, space, and, space time, and time, and, an and the invisible universe, universe of spiritual, of spiritual energies. energies. Mark Rothko described his paintings as having direct spiritual significance, saying that, The fact that lots of people break down with pride when confronted with my pictures shows that I communicate those basic human emotions. The people who weep before my pictures are having the same religious experience I had, the same I religious experience I had when I painted them. Piet Mondrian's work was heavily immersed in his practice of theosophy, 
a sort of cultish movement which sought to blur the lines between religions to find more objective spiritual truths. You can't help but laugh a little bit at the audacity Cocteau has to call his future projects art for God when he's been Catholic again for like five seconds and would leave the church again five seconds later. A little overdramatic to be like, yes, I am translating God into common language. But what you see in Cocteau, Rothko, and Mondrian especially is this desire to exist outside of theological bounds to find more objective spiritual truths. Cocteau began reinterpreting myths and stories like Orpheus and Beauty and the Beast to explore spiritual magic. Rothko grew up Jewish but ended up decorating a Christian church and painting triptychs of crucifixion without actually being Christian at all. Mondrian, of course, was immersed in this theosophy thing. There's a real sense in all of these people's work, and honestly, my own experience too, that artwork is not created from your own will, but by some force running through you. It's a flow state that passes hours and seconds and leaves you with ideas fresh and raw and yet still mysterious. Every time I had to explain a piece in school for critiques or artist statements, I always felt like I wasn't saying what actually drove the creative decisions, but offering my own interpretations of the decisions I made because they felt right. I mean, really what I'm talking about here is not a recent concept either. It goes all the way back to ancient times. Call it the muse or call it the song of a man who has come through, as the writer D.H. Lawrence puts in this poem. Not I, not I, but the wind that blows through me. A fine wind is blowing the new direction of time. If only I let it bear me, carry me, if only it carry me. If only I am sensitive, subtle, oh, delicate, a winged gift. If only, most lovely of all, I yield myself and am borrowed by the fine, fine wind that takes its course through the chaos of the world, like a fine and exquisite chisel, a wedge blade inserted, if only I am keen and hard like the sheer tip of a wedge driven by invisible blows, the rock will split. We shall come at the wonder. We shall find the Hesperides. Oh, for the wonder that bubbles into my soul, I would be a good fountain, a good wellhead, would blur no whisper, spoil no expression. What is the knocking? What is the knocking at the door in the night? It is somebody who wants to do us harm. No. No, it is the three strange angels. Admit them. Admit them. Good stuff. Lewis Hyde's book, The Gift, is where I found that poem. This book is the essential framework for understanding the spiritual dimensions of art making, as well as how that marries with the market economy Hyde was writing in. And, you know, we're still in now. He writes, An essential portion of any artist's labor is not creation so much as invocation. Part of the work cannot be made, it must be received. And we cannot have this gift except perhaps by supplication, by courting, by creating within ourselves that begging bowl to which the gift is drawn. A great idea is an electric feeling, like when you're first falling in love. Your body is acting two steps ahead of your mind, and every step it takes feels right. Suddenly, in the early evening, the poem The Dance started and finished itself in a very short time, say 30 minutes, maybe in the greater part of an hour. It was all done. I felt, I knew, I had hit it. I walked around and I wept, and I knelt down, I always do after I've written what I know is a good piece. But at the same time, I had, as God as my witness, the actual sense of a presence, as if Yeats himself were in that room. The experience was in a way terrifying, for it lasted at least half an hour. That house, I repeat, was charged with a psychic presence. The very walls seemed to shimmer. I wept for joy. He, they, the poets dead, were with me. Maybe it's an exaggeration to be weeping on the floor with joy after writing something you know hits just right. I can't say I've had that experience. 
But it is exhilarating, and you just want to share it with the world. And maybe that's why art is public. Maybe that's why Hyde calls it a gift. And honestly, describing it feels pretty impossible to do without sounding pretentious as hell. But, and Hyde points this out, a gift also carries with it this desire to give back to what helped create that idea. If Rothke felt like Yeats himself was there, he felt the need at least to thank Yeats for the inspiration. This giving back is how Hyde argues that art making is humble and selfless. Because good art gives back in some way to people, deities, places, communities, or traditions, it requires a consideration of a larger picture in order to do it successfully. The artist has to be thinking beyond themselves in order to make valuable contributions. It's why things are dedicated, or special thanks are given in the liner notes. I can't remember where I found it now, but I read an artist statement one time that was literally just a list of bands the person listened to when creating the work. Our old pal Cocteau wanted, for about 10 seconds in his life, to give it back to God. No, to make it for him. But it goes a bit deeper than that. Certain inspirations can find a way to latch on to the work and be found directly mixed into it. What Art for God is about is this true marrying of divine inspiration with work that may not feel all that divine. And it's not to say that there is no self-injection or intellectual choices. Not everything is purely felt from somewhere beyond. There is a balance, I have to admit, between something that is intuited and something that is prescribed. I think David Lynch, a favorite around here, has a good perspective on the layers of controllable will put into an artwork. It's not that you think so intellectually, like you decide, I'm going to use blue because blue gives me a, a strange, cool feeling, and this is a very cold character, or something like that. It's not an intellectual overlay. It's living inside the ideas and being true to them. Look, I'm not one to make dedications to God. But I think that there's something there. It's no coincidence that all of these abstract artists and more were thinking about some kind of spiritual materiality to art itself. It's just that, I guess, I just don't have any faith that that's enough. For every person who gets on their knees and weeps at the sight of one of Rothko's paintings, there have been those who balk at and even vandalized his work. It hasn't brought about any real change. It's just been ammunition in a culture war that has built a society that doesn't care about art at all. I mean, what good is spiritualism if nobody is listening? With all this talk of gifts, back and forth, from muse to artist to audience and back to muse, it creates an idea of an artist's life that is committed to the lord of art. Hyde pulls from another religious artist, this time a writer, Flannery O'Connor, who says, Art is a virtue of the practical intellect. And the practice of any virtue demands a certain asceticism and a very definite leaving behind of the stingy part of the ego. The writer has to judge himself with a stranger's eye and a stranger's severity. No art is sunk in the self, but rather, in art, the self becomes self-forgetful in order to meet the demands of the thing seen and the thing being made. The asceticism, the ego death, the self-abnegation, these are aspects of Hyde and O'Connor's view that create this image of the artist who lives in almost monastic lifestyle. Monastic life creates a series of rules to follow in order to achieve a close relationship with God and thus carry out his will in the world. Much in the same way, Hyde employs a more sporadic series of rules and ideas about that type of life an artist ought to live to be able to channel the gift most effectively. 
Artistic reverence, holiness, perception, weeping, these are concepts that have driven a spiritual artistic approach. This self-serious dedication to art making that elevates the artist to this lofty status is exactly the thing the art for art's sake perspective seeks to critique and make fun of. It's the thing that made people question what art is, who can make it, and why we put so much value in it in the first place. While you were busy thinking about God, I was making a joke. Both are seen as equally valid. For every spiritual abstract artist, there was a satirist or dadaist to poke and prod at this elevated status. All of this is to say, even back then, evangelizing the position of the artist is not something that really made people commit to making art a larger part of their lives. I recognize framing the entire art world in this way as spiritual versus secular does a lot of reduction to the reasons people create stuff, but this 100-year-old debate still rages on, as some galleries and museums still debate whether art should have this elevated status or if something as mundane as a meme should be considered art. Artists make both, critique the other, but regardless of the side, these internal debates happen within a system that keeps on chugging and profiting off of either side of this debate. Whether you're comparing the Duchamp ready-made to a Richter painting, a Warhol soup can to a Kandinsky musical composition, neither side of this debate speaks to the real problem of art's increased alienation from the lives of the people in favor of an increasingly smaller number of audiences and ultra-wealthy collectors. Talking about these outlooks on the world and sharing these ideas about the phenomenology of art making is important, but comes at a bad time for art as an industry and society as a whole. I opened this video talking about climate change as the fire at the end of the tunnel. And that situation is not helped at all through infighting. There's equally no good response to critics of modern art that decry either the over-romanticization of art or critique the more profane stuff as not being important enough. So out of touch with culture, so out of touch with reality. With a nice sized hole punched into the arts at the beginning of the century that divorced it so much with monarchy and religious institutions of old, and artists too busy getting mad at each other and making diss tracks of each other to organize any kind of institutions of their own to value art, new powerful organizations could sweep in and define its trajectory. Artists could serve a spiritual purpose for a new god capitalism and the interests of empire. essay Hyde tacked on to the 25th anniversary edition of the book, Hyde talks about how the avant-garde experimental artist creating work of true cultural and spiritual value was a very deliberate vision of the arts pushed by the US during the Cold War. The seemingly asocial eccentric in his cabin at the edge of town is not actually outside his country, quite the opposite. He inhabits the true America, the one the Soviets can never see if they focus only on the money-grubbing side of capitalism. We are the last civilized nation on the earth to recognize that the arts and humanities have a place in our national life, declared a New Jersey congressman in 1965. He mentions how the arts were directly funded by the government to get as weird and experimental as possible in the mid 20th century to serve as a stark contrast to the strict stylistic policies imposed by the USSR and China. Through projects like the Advancing American Art Exhibition, an avant-garde was pushed on to Western audiences, because it was owning the Russians, since something like that would never hang in their galleries. Artists like Jackson Pollock were paid to warp abstraction from an effort to make art for God to an effort to make art for America. Now personally, I like Jackson Pollock quite a bit. 
I think if you go to the gallery and look at his work from the side, it's like looking at the surface of a colorful planet with mountains and valleys and rivers just because there's so many layers of paint on there. But by the 1980s, the Cold War was ending, and what we were left with was a generation of artists told to create whatever they wanted, and a government program that made it economically viable as long as you fit their specific criteria and had no moral economic beliefs. Because that artistic freedom is the American way. Even artists who weren't directly government funded, at least at first, benefited from a culture that was far more welcoming to people with new ideas and new styles, as well as projects to actually sell their artwork. To those like me, who grew up with a belief in a time when new artists were directly in the public eye, and the arts as an institution were promoted, it's a rude awakening. Like waking up from a dream where you just ignored all the weird parts, artists were and are continually duped into thinking that the powers that be care at all, and not that the entire point of funding art was to say, hey commies, this is what freedom looks like. That's why it's funny to me that the stereotype artist is a left-wing communist, because for decades they were played to back up capitalism and still are, but now by art institutions and newly created crypto ones. If an artist couldn't be sold to back up capital's interests, or we just didn't like them because they were people of color or LGBT, a new market-based art economy that formed has a perfect way of consuming movements and alienating artists through simply not displaying their work and plunging them into the category of starving artist. The coalescence of the art market into a few cities with a few galleries that handpick the artists who will represent the art world at their insular fairs allows the market to regulate itself out of any challenge to capitalist order without government funding. So, without a war to fight and the seeds of a market to plant, government funding became logically unnecessary here in America. The National Endowment of the Arts, the primary non-CIA government funding program for artists, started falling under heavy criticism by the neoconservative movement of the 1980s, which argued it directly funded smut and filth that poisoned our culture. Of course, how many times have you heard someone critique a work of modern art by saying, my five-year-old could paint that? Within government funding contexts, it happened, for example, when Andres Serrano photographed a crucifix in a jar of urine. And then it happened again when Robert Maplethorpe photographed gay BDSM culture and the AIDS epidemic at the inconvenient time when the government was trying to hide all that. Then finally, at least as far as our discussion is concerned, Sally Mann used government funding for her project Immediate Family, a collection of incredible large format photos of her kids growing up in rural Virginia. And I want to talk about how they did Sally Mann dirty for a second. The whole CIA had their hearts set on showing off beautiful or experimental art as the symbol of American freedom. And then when government funding finally delivered it, they called it fucking child porn. This is Americana. The kids playing, having fun, exploring, swimming holes, trucks, forests, rivers, and the large format film having this black and white timelessness? This is textbook stuff to sell the American dream abroad. The children's nudity was man capturing them as they were. But in a fit of irony given this conversation, religious groups accused her of sexualizing her own children and abusing them by photographing them injured with nosebleeds or wetting the bed. A specific photograph British writer Nicky Gerrard liked to a prostitute with her lover just departed, not like a little girl, fast asleep, who has just wet her bed. Raymond Sokolov censored a photo of man's daughter Virginia, with black bars covering her eyes, nipples, and crotch in the Wall Street Journal, a move done without man's permission which deeply offended Virginia herself. All man wanted was to capture the experience of motherhood in the American South and its ups and downs, and all she got was public outrage. I guess every parent thinks their child is the most amazing, marvelous thing ever on earth. I use my photographs to reflect that astonishment and gratitude. This, I think, is a moment that Western cultures realized that art, with its incredible ability as Cocteau wanted and as spiritual artists proved to speak to the human soul and human experience, 
is probably more of a liability to their survival than an asset. Conceptual art, abstract art, these things we've discussed at length already, have a superpower to sing to the human soul. Just ask anyone who weeps at Rothko. They also have a power to make people balk at their simplicity. They say, how could something so simple have such cultural significance? And unfortunately, that side is winning. The National Endowment reports museum attendance dropping 16.8% in recent years, despite population growth and efforts to make museums free. More and more articles come out sounding the alarm of failing cultural institutions, like this one that says, hey, just because art museums are failing doesn't mean history museums will, or this one that describes how, with declining attendance numbers, increasingly it's the case that museums are being asked to better compute and quantify the benefits they bring to their audiences, and to do so in a basins to market forces. This is happening in spite of museologists, in the last 20 years or so, fundamentally rethinking the museum experience, from the ethos of, we have the greatest artwork in the world and you should feel privileged to even be allowed to see it, to something more personalized and inclusive. This place is our home, and we want it to be yours too. You're an independent meaning maker, that's one of the buzzwords going around, and we're not going to tell you anymore whether you should respect or appreciate our artwork or not. And then of course, 2020 saw huge declines in museum attendance and engagement for <clears throat> pretty obvious reasons that threw a lot of smaller museums, including one I used to work with, into a world of even more economic precarity. Because art can give you and me a lot of value through experiencing it, it's easy to ignore that we have a culture with a new predisposition against the art world, thinking that modern art is vulgar, disgusting, bourgeois, and pretentious. And instead of pointing the finger at the institutions that created those problems, it's pointed at the artists. And then on top of all of this, artists don't really do much to help. Nothing adds a cherry on top of this shit Sunday, like artists claiming that no, what they're doing is actually channeling ideas from some spiritual dimension, talking about how they have this gift that offers profound ideas to flow through in mysterious ways. Now, regardless to how accurate to the experience of art making that discussion may be, it does nothing but reproduce and highlight the exact issues and disparities those accusations against art unfairly come from in the first place. Nobody asked for the commercial art world to even exist. Sure, some great stuff can come out of it, but anyone who isn't an artist you've heard of and is actively working is someone who deserves none of the blame for why artist is seen as non-essential to society and purely academic. We're right back to where we were when Cocteau was writing initially. Art needs to change its role in society, and it has been framed by me this whole time as if it's stuck between giving up all the spiritual conversation for a more art for art's sake approach or embracing that human need. People can't decide what they want it to do. Should it be an engine of activism, always having good takes and consistent ideology, or should art just try to act like what's going on around it isn't happening? Should it comfort us as the ship sinks, like the titanic band playing the violins until they all drowned? Or should it try fruitlessly to get the attention to the iceberg the ship is about to ram into if we don't change course? Should it cater to as many people as possible or speak directly to individual experiences? Should artists participate in a system many of them hate to get any kind of career? Or should they think of new ways to define what an artist is and how they get financially compensated in society? Should I be making art for God or art for art's sake? I don't know, but I know this. Forgetting our humanity is how we swallow the bitter pill of bombing children in the Middle East, of rampant poverty, of our complacency with any kind of horrible thing that's done in our name without our consent. When we forget our humanity, we're imperialized. We're able to be okay with this stuff. Thus, the human spirit, or whatever you want to call it, that all of these people have written about as having a special relationship with art making specifically is the most dangerous thing imaginable to the forces of empire. It's the thing that makes us realize that what's happening to us and to others is not good. 
Maybe art is disliked by your uncle or hometown friends because it hasn't spoken to them yet. Because the 20th century built art institutions out of white walls in cities they don't live in that were never for them. So, I don't know how, but make the thing that is. Hey moon, will you climb out of the sky tonight? The house is on fire and I'm etherized. I'll tell you a joke, you can tell me if it's the funny kind. Hey moon, I could use. Somewhere was